Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the KP Podcast, the podcast where we get to know more about your favorite bands, maybe get to know some bands you've never heard of. Uh, That sample you just heard was some uh, music off the newest album of the guy we're about to talk to. Uh, I've been a fan of this guy, oh gosh, for nine, ten years since I've heard his first music. Uh, You guys... Might not know about his band, you might not know about his old band, you might not know him at all, but we're going to get to know him. Right now we're going to be talking to Shaylee Bourget of the band Day Shell. Shaylee, how are you doing today, man? Doing good, man. Feeling good. How are you? I'm great, man. I am pumped AF to do this interview, so again, thank you. Uh, We're going to dive right into it. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go way way back. Uh, I want to start with your musical career. Uh, many fans of your work will recognize you from the first two of Mice and Men albums. Uh, how and when did you start involvement with that band? Um, it was like it was actually a pivotal moment of my life. Um, I was I was in a, my first band, which was Covet, which is basically Day Shell, but a younger version of it before whatever. But that band ended, so I was kind of in purgatory, and I got a uh, message from uh, Tino, the drummer, on MySpace, when MySpace was still alive back in oh, the day. Oh, MySpace, okay. And he, yeah. And he, he he mentioned, yo, we're looking for a singer, are you interested? And I'm like, sure, man, just like send me the music. And then I did a little research on, you know, of Mice and Men and how they're formed and where uh, the singer Austin came from. And I realized that people were gravitating towards that music. I'm like, hey, man, this might be a good opportunity. But... You know, he kind of ghosted me for a little bit, and then I hit him up again, and I was like, yo, is this still happening? And he said, nah. So fast forward, I started another band, and, you know, I'm working my ass off and doing this new band called Chapters, and then I get a, a message from him on MySpace again saying, hey, man, our singer isn't working out. We're kind of in a crunch. We leave to the studio in two weeks. Um, would you mind trying out? And I'm like, well, hell yeah. I have nothing else <laughs> to lose. Right. So I, I went and tried out like a goofball with sandals on and cut off, you know, knee high shorts and a salmon t shirt <laughs> and an explorer guitar, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just straight up didn't fit at all. But, you know, that's what I had and that's who I was at the time. And uh, I think it was like I could tell, like, in the practice room, they're like, this is the guy. So the next day they said, all right, we're leaving in two days uh, to go record the album. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that all started. Now, I love hearing these stories. I love hearing about when people got introduced to the right people and all that stuff. Um, You've been a guitar player for a long time before this, correct? Yeah, I'm I'm originally a guitar player. I just moved to vocals by default. Okay, and now I think I saw you post, I want to say on Instagram, something along the lines of you weren't always committed to being uh, a singer. What really made you go, yeah, I can do this? Yeah, like 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 I said, it, it was all by default. Like um, back in the early days when I first discovered my voice, I was I'm very shy, you know, timid person. Um, but I also have a extroverted side of me. But for the most part, I don't like being the center of attention mm-hmm. at all. So when we were in our when I first band Covet, we were we had a singer. We recorded. We we finally got this guy that had like this shitty like I don't know eight track recording thing back in like I don't know. This was probably oh four mm-hmm. and um. So we recorded demo and we had this cool singer and me and him were working on melodies and I was helping him write melodies and just digging in my head and me and him were going to town. So we record the the demo and I do the little backup harmonies. And the next day he calls me and he goes, yo, dude, I hate to break this to you, but I have to quit the band. I, I just don't feel like it's my place. And I'm like, what, man? We just recorded, bro. <laughs> right. You know? So, uh, you know, basically he said, he actually inspired me. He was the one. His name's uh Josh Caddy, I don't know where he is anymore, but he inspired me because he said, dude, I'm going to be completely honest with you, and I'm not trying to just blow sunshine up your ass or whatever, however he said it back then. He was just like, dude, every time your voice, like, you know, your harmonies hit, it's just so much more powerful and 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 more and better for this music. And he's like, I really think you should work on singing, man. I think you got what it takes. And I'm like, okay. I told the band what he said, and they're like, you know, like three of the, of the, maybe two of the four other guys were like gung ho, and then the other two, especially the drummer at the time, he was like, "No way, dude! No way!" He didn't want it. I'm like, "All right, dude. Well, it's either I sing and I don't want to. Just mind you, 
I'm doing this for us. I'm taking one for the team. <laughs> right. So it's either I team or we don't have a singer. So he's like, fine. And then long story <laughs> short, here I am. Now, I asked that yeah. question because you, uh, not to just be fan fan girling over here, but you are one of my favorite uh, vocalists when it comes to singing. Um, now, when you talk, when you're talking about uh, you tried out two weeks before the uh, recording process, and when I say the year, it's going to blow everyone's mind that this album dropped 10 years ago back in 2010. Uh, what was the writing process like, and what was your involvement for this self-titled of Mice and Men album? It was very scattered. I mean, the, 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 the band was a built band, so nobody really knew nobody for the most part. Maybe cross paths, maybe acquaintances, but it was all like label built, and they built a super band, and I was the final ingredient. So when I got there, most of the songs were written, but it was a scattered of people. Uh, I don't even know. But the, the thing that it lacked was lead. So in the studio, I wrote all my vocal parts, of course. Uh, we, we refined some structures with uh, Joey Sturges. Uh, and then obviously I was like, dude, we need to put some freaking leads on here. Dude, this is pretty bland if we're just going to be, you know, so I just put as many leads as I could think of over it. And that was basically my involvement. It was still fun nonetheless. You know, I still got to be creative. So that's, that's what matters to me the most in the studio. See, I never would have imagined that. And again, I love hearing these stories because um, I guess fans have this, oh, everyone knew each other forever and we become friends and they went in and everyone had a big share in the song. And so I like hearing these stories. Um, what was really the biggest reaction out of that first album? If you can remember, recall. The biggest reaction I think was, I mean, for me, um, is when we dropped second and see ring. I don't think people like, nobody knew who I was at that point. So, you know, the reaction of people going like, Whoa, dude, this is kind of, shifting the metalcore scene into a more uh mature realm i guess yeah. or like you know i don't know and uh, the reaction was cool because that became a fan favorite immediately and i remember writing that song in my pt cruiser with this crappy like one mic in a room demo <laughs> they sent me wow <laughs> yeah that's a lot of people's favorites even today 10 years later um, so that's the first album. Uh, between the first album and the 2011 album, The Flood, uh, there was a slight lineup change seeing you move from guitar to bass. Uh, what was this change like? Uh, not just to you, for the band, everyone involved. Uh, and was the writing or recording process any different? Was it still scattered? Anything like that? Um, it was It was a shift for me. I mean, the only reason why I moved to bass, just to clarify, wasn't because I lacked in guitar at all, or wasn't because I didn't want to play guitar. What it really, really tr truly boiled down to at one point, the guitar player, Phil and uh, Austin weren't getting along. So he, Austin was talking to management and me, but I guess they're having their own conversation. And we dropped this guy that was filling in for uh, Austin. He was like a vocalist and the, uh, I guess they dropped Phil as well, but I wasn't aware of that. Oh, okay. So I was like, whoa, wait, Phil's out of the band? Like, well, no, I mean, yeah, we've had talks that, you know, such and such and such, and we don't like this, we don't like that, but we didn't have, like, a prime discussion. So I was like, you know, he calls me, and I talked it out, and I basically, I took one for him to be a good bro, and I said, dude, you know, as long as you focus on change, you know, at the time, you know, he's grown, I'm sure he's an awesome guy now, but as long as you focus on change, um, you know, I'll move to bass because that might help me focus more on my singing and have give me more freedom. And at the same time, it's another instrument for me to to discover more of and and master in a way. Absolutely. So yeah, I I moved to bass for that reason. But as far as the writing goes, I was huge on the second album because, like I said, the first album I joined pretty late in the game. I mean, a week and a half. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> so until they went to the studio. So this time around, I was able to. Uh, really really right you know that's why like i think more than half the album are my own originals that uh you know i wrote and then austin wrote his vocals over uh so yeah it actually was it was a funner album because i was able to really put forth a little bit more um of my musical uh taste mm -hmm. and ability because you know i'm not necessarily a metalcore kid i i, I am not at all but I, I do enjoy it and i love the rhythm and i love the culture um it was just it was just nice to get a little more melodic in my sense in those music or in those songs, you know? Right. And have a lot more of your own 
not just opinions, but here's here's my riff, here's my idea, here's my lyrical stuff, um, all that stuff compared to the first album. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, so I'm trying to remember. There was a time between those two albums where Austin was actually out of the band, and then for one of those cover songs from, I think, Fearless Records, uh, like Pop Goes Punk, uh, the older vocalist from Sky East Airplane was the vocalist for a minute. Then yeah. there was, I think I remember this YouTube clip, Austin and Alan, I think. He, he, he fa- Austin found Alan somewhere and started a new band. Then everyone was like, well, let's just get Austin back. And then that's when you were on bass and Alan was now the second guitar player. Am I correct in all this or am I kind of off? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the vocalist that was, filling in that we did make official for a short period of time he just wasn't working out the respect and all this at the time you know like i said people have changed i'm not trying to talk shit on them now but at the time it was it was so so disrespectful and hard that i pretty much gave an ultimatum i said either i sing or we bring austin back because for one i didn't really have a problem with austin at that time because i was i was the new guy you know what i mean yeah so I didn't really know what all this was all about, and all I knew is I kind of, I understood uh, where everybody was coming from, and I had to follow the flow with the band. You know, I had to be a team player. If that was their decision, then I support that, and we move forward. But we, you know, when we grabbed the fill-in guy, it was it was definitely a wake-up call. I think for everyone to be like, he wasn't that bad. You know what I mean? Right. I got gotcha. you. So, so yeah, that's how that went down. Okay, so I just wanted to get that clarified because that's been stuck in my mind for I want to say a few years now. Uh, I'm going to find that YouTube clip and have to <laughs> remind myself again. Uh, of Mice and Men were and still to this day are no strangers to touring. Uh, what were some of your favorite experiences touring with the band? I think Australia. We had a really that was one of my favorite times because for one, I like. I, I mean, Australia is just a very loving place it's not like america people care they respect you and they're just all for the most part they're happy and they take care of themselves you know unlike america where you just everybody hates each other and eats fucking mcdonald's every day absolutely (laughs) i loved it there plus we were playing gigantic shows i mean like for me back in those times it's kind of a blur just because we were always kind of like just partying around and just being dumb but but still like the way that i felt on that tour was probably the best because it was just, I don't know, just a check on my bucket list. Right. And I have a story at the very end of this interview um, about meeting you, meeting Austin, and seeing you guys live at Warp Tour, RIP Warp Tour. Um, in a, a few brief words, what was it like playing these massive shows in front of so many people, singing the words that you wrote back at you? I don't know. I'm I'm always just like such. I know when people like ask me that question, it's so hard for me to answer without like seeming unappreciative in a sense. But I don't know. I never really truly knew how to feel, and I didn't know. Uh, I don't know. I I mean, it's so weird. I mean, it was happening, but it wasn't happening for me at the same time. Not like not happening as, and I didn't appreciate it. It just like I wasn't registering in my brain, and it's like all the time. I always think I wish I could go back and appreciate it more. You know, rather than right. being whatever caught up in my head with whatever I'm doing with my depression at the time. And it's like, I wish I could have just been a clear mind and smiled and saw like, I mean, there was one show that was the most insane. We played Chicago, uh, first year of Warped Tour. And there was, so, there were so many people there for us. It was wrapping around our stage. And as far as the eye could see, they broke the barrier. And there was like seven pits going on throughout, you know, as far as the eye can see massive wow. ones. So like, I do remember that. And I, that <laughs> feeling was like, holy shit you know this is the stuff that i watched on you know vhs dude like back in the day of my favorite bands just wishing i could be like lincoln park playing these huge festivals and here i am so i did get a moment of that but for the most part not to sound depressing i just i I wish i could go back and appreciate it more i gotcha i love the honesty uh and it does transition well into the next question so after release of the flood uh, you did announce that you would no longer be part of, of Mice and Men. Uh, for those who never really knew the entire story, would you mind sharing why you decided to leave? Yeah, I mean, um, for the most part, you know, back in those days, Mice and Men was a party band, and I don't really, I don't mean by drugs or anything. Like, we, as far as my knowledge goes, nobody was doing drugs. 
we just drank a lot and smoked weed. You know what I mean? Just mm. a typical uh, early 20s thing. But that became a consistent party. So I was fine until I injured my back. And I, did, I tripped and fell with somebody on me on a curb. And it changed my life. Uh, and I already suffered from anxiety. So putting that in the mix, and, and I, I suffer from like stage fright and stuff, putting that in the mix and having this pain that I've never been, I, that I can't even describe that is still, I live with today on an even worse level. Um, I just grown to deal, but it was like, it was definitely taking me down a dark path. And the, the contradiction of it all was even if like I would go to the chiropractor, you know, here and there, we didn't making money when I was in the band at all. You see us in a bus, we didn't make any money. We had a bus, congratulations, and we had our stuff paid for, but I go home with maybe $200 from a tour. Really? You know, and just, I'm not even joking. It wasn't until the tail end of me being in that band where we started to make a little more than $200, I believe. We haven't even cycled our royalties yet. You know, we there was a lot, you know. So, of that too, I wasn't able to focus on my health, and I was touring all the time, dude, and it was just a party all the time. So when I was trying to you know, heal my mind and my body and not do this. There was a party going on till three in the morning with random people in and out, slamming doors, throwing up. Like it was making me go insane, you know? Oh yeah. So I did have a nervous breakdown at one point. Uh, it was crazy. So, uh, they decided to, and it was on tour. So they decided to send me home to focus on my health, which I did. I did my best. The thing that I think led me to my, absolute decision is the lack and this isn't talk shit on them but this is literally how i felt at the time and what it looked like to me and even like today sometimes i look at it and i still go man i wish but uh there was a lack a large lack of brotherhood like i mean we we did it all together and when i dropped out that tour and i was hurting the worst you know and i needed my boys the most none of them were there for me you know in fact there was one point where somebody tried to sabotage me in the van i won't say who but it was fuck, you know, it was screwed up, and I just felt so alienated. Even the management team was giving me a cold shoulder, and it was, it was like, okay. So I kept fighting, and they finally get home, and then we have a dinner, sit down. It starts at whatever time. I get there 20 minutes early. I walk in. They've already eaten, so I'm like, okay. So I sit down, and it was just basically, you know, a round table of the negative things they didn't like about me, which I already knew. And I could just tell, dude, like, I could just tell that uh, these aren't bad people at all whatsoever. They're super hardworking, and, I, I, you know, I love their work ethic and, you know, all that stuff. But I could just tell, like, they didn't really want me there anymore. They didn't trust my my mental state. And, you know, above that, it, to me, it felt like they didn't have that brotherly love that that made me feel like they're there for me. Yeah. So I, if I would have continued in that band, I would have been this oddball out constantly walking on eggshells. And, and for what, for people that I don't feel is my true brother, because they didn't even call or text. They didn't ask how I was doing. Like I, like I was, I was sent home with no money, you know, and I had nothing, you know, it's like, but you know, I, as, as time goes on, you know, I let that stuff go. And I understand that we're just kids and they're caught up in it too. Like, you know, th there's a lot and everybody grows, you know? So right. nonetheless, I mean, the silver lining in it all, if, it, if you want to call it that is I did eventually get a grip on my health because I took a seat back and I wasn't in a crazy touring situation that had, was so much demanding, so much anxiety. So I finally got a, a grip on that. And, you know, for the, the best part of that is I was able to, continue to do music and have an audience that I built with a mic and men and, you know, explore me, me as an artist, you know, like truly like with all the knowledge that I've built and the, the, the influence from being in the metal core scene and develop what I am now. So I don't think I'd be writing this great of music if I wasn't in this position. And that's not to say my music's phenomenal or anything, but you know what I mean? Like right. I would be, I would be because metal core only goes so far, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. Uh, now, as a big fan of your of you and of the, both bands, I, I didn't know all this stuff. Uh, so I thank you for opening up and clarifying uh, that for not just me, but anyone that might not know. 
Um, now we're going to move on to uh, some of the newer stuff. I mean, you didn't stay away from music too long, and you released your very own music under the name Day Shell in 2013. Uh, can you walk us through what it was like writing, recording, and ultimately releasing this album, or the first album, and what the reception was? Well, when I left with my two men, um, I was already in talks with one of my old buddies at the time that was in my very first band. So basically what I did is I rebuilt my first band, brought the, the same members back. Um, the transition was tough because even though, even at the time, I probably made it look like I was doing better, but I was honestly still continuing to decline. So <laughs> the writing process of that was a little slow, to say the least. Um, and But, you know, all in all, I still was able to, to d- dive into what I was trying to do. Like, I mean, I'm, the one thing that well, can't, you can't stop me do is do music. I don't care if it's alcoholism or anything that, you know, what I was going through, which alcoholism was, is what I'm talking about for the most part. If I haven't clarified, is that what I was going through? Because once I injured my back, it became the only thing accessible for me to ease the pain from my physical and my mind, you know? So it became my, my pacifier, literally. So it took a little bit longer to write that album, but it was, it was definitely an eye opener to, for me to see like, you know, where I'm going to go as a musician with, with the new influence that is, I picked up along the way being in the metal course scene because I never was. Um, but we wrote as much as we could in, in a, you know, our garage or lockout and then, uh, you know, set out to record the album and we, we, we did it. We barely made it through, but we did it. Yes, you did do it. And it sounds amazing. Um, and that, again, I'm not just trying to fanboy over here. Uh, but it does sound amazing. Um, what really, what did writing this music mean to you when you put that album out? What did people say? What was the reception to that? I think, I think it was shock. It was the shock for the most part because you know a lot of my fans actually didn't know where I was coming from, where I came from before, uh, you know, of my cement. So the reception was good. I just was still blinded i still have my blinders on dude like you know what i mean like i was just trying to get through each day and that in itself is so uh mentally taxing i hate to make this a whole depressing thing but you know i'm i i I pride myself on being honest and showing people what i've overcome and like letting them know that if i can do it dude seriously if i can do it i truly believe this you can do it because i have it bad dude (laughs) like i had to go over every hurdle known to man and i still you know, live them. So it's like, you know, that's, you know, I just want to be honest. And you're still prevailing today, which is even better. Yeah, man. I mean, that's, it's the fight. You fight for your life every day. I mean, we only have one and you can't just sit back and watch it go by, even though that I feel like I'm doing that simultaneously, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. Productively, but either way, I'm still fighting. So at least I have that pride and I feel like a human being. Right. Okay. Great answer. I love that attitude. Uh, so let's fast forward a little bit. 2016, you released their second album, Nexus. Were there any uh, lyrical differences or themes or anything different about this album when approaching it, uh, when writing this album? Yeah. Um, going into this album, I was getting a little familiar with recording. So I was recording my own demos in GarageBand. So I was able to have that ability to, to write on tour and just get my ideas across however shitty they sound sounded. Um, but what, what the, the, the point of going in that one was like, dude, I want to get a little more of that gent flair into the music, but not in a gent you know, esque way. I want to just bring it in it like subtly and kind of have it there, you know? Okay. And I also wanted to make the album a more linear album, meaning it's more of a focus, not as sporadic, you know, acoustic song in the middle of the album, blah, 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 shit, you know? Um, so we did that and, uh, we also wanted to focus on a little more on a raw tone and lyrically, I was very angry at that time. Very, very angry. Um, so I really, and I, and, and, and I had this, like, I don't care anymore because I'm, it's not how I feel anymore. But at the time I was just like, you know, if everybody worships this old Lord, old Savior, what the fuck is happening to this world? And why am I getting punished? And why can't I find an escape? So I started to get a little, 
uh, atheist or <laughs> if you must or whatever. Right. But, you know, I respect religion in all, all, in all honesty. I just, you know, that was my album to, to pretty much tell the world that I just don't believe and this is why and this is the only way that I know how to explain myself and the safest way because everything's a metaphor, you know. I can play something that's 1,000% Christian and put on um, spit in your face and they wouldn't know nothing. Exactly. They think it's a cool song. Exactly. And I'm literally talking about spinning in the face of your guy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so now, last year, 2019, uh, that's your latest release titled Mr. Pain. Why this title? Uh, can you explain the crowdfunding behind it? Uh, and can you explain the writing and recording process and the reception yeah, of the album? I did this. Okay, so after Nexus and after touring and doing all of that, uh, it got to another halt where, you know, once again, not making money. Once again, you know, like, I mean, it, we I never made a dime until day. Desh- I never made a dime in Deshell until just a few months ago, put it that way. Wow. Um, so, you know, after so many odd years, you know, people can only take so much. And then, uh, uh, you know, vendettas are built, you know, invisible vendettas. And people start doing stupid things that are almost like unforgivable. But you've you got to take a step back. And it's like, dude, it's just the situation. It's making us all crazy. We're fighting for no reason, you know. Mm-hmm. Or at least we're not getting any um, anything out of it other than you made a cool song. Cool, you know. But so everyone's leaving and i just said you know what dude if if it's me if it's them if it's anybody whatever i'm going to prove to myself and them i guess not to shove it in their face because it was more so prove to myself that anybody can do it you just have to have the self-awareness and the focus and i took those two words and i ran with them so i was like well i gotta throw hell mary dude there's only one shot or I have to save up forever or throw down with somebody will work. So I'm like, I'm going to launch a campaign. And originally I was going to launch it for 10,000, but I'm like, dude, that's not going to cover nothing, dude. It's not going to cover nothing. So I doubled it. And I was like, well, even if we get close, I'm going to use the GoFundMe because, you know, you don't have to meet your goal. So I still win no matter what. Right. I can still figure it out. So I launched it. And after like a little over two months, smashed, smashed it over the budget. And, uh, that was just that, you know, that was a lot of fire that lit. So getting into writing, uh, I ended up buying a new computer and investing into, you know, a better recording, uh, DAW and just diving in and saying, dude, I'm so fuck, I'm so sick of working with people and paying $400 for these crap ass demos that yeah, don't absolutely. even, that don't even like grab what I'm trying my vision. So I'm like, well, I can't be getting myself upset and I can't take it out on them because it's, what are they going to do? Dive in my head. So I have to figure out how to, how to do it and present my demos in the best, you know, format. So I dove in and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote, dude, and I didn't stop. I moved up to the mountains for like five months up in Idlewild, California. I wrote up there isolation, um, all while going through all my pain. And, and also, that album was the first sober album I did. So, and, and I have been sober for like over two years, but that album was, yeah, the first album that I literally wrote, recorded and did everything with not a drop of alcohol in my system. So, well, not to, um, not to pause you. I do want to say congrats on that because coming from someone that's straight edge, I know how hard it can be from all the influences around and everything. So congrats on that, man. Yeah. Well, my, my thing was cut out all those influences. So I had to become isolated. Gotcha. You know, I had to, um, I had to do it. So, but it was such, it was such a important time for me to, to write now because I was picking it up fast because it was all I had and I was in survival mode. And I mean that, like I was scared for my life and my career and my, my legacy and who I was, you know, like, so I just kicked in. The writing was more directed towards if, if this is my last album, how would it sound? You know, I want to do all the songs that I want to do and so break up so it'll, but I want to add more songs so basically I went like well the first album was really diverse and dynamic the second album was more straightforward in a sense so why don't I just have those have a baby and here we go I'll just add more songs so I can do more wacko songs on it you know right, right. and uh, and there you go you know and it, also I wanted to make the fans happy and I care because when they're happy I'm happy it's not a form of selling out to me it's just a little compromise that you know 
I just got a tweak and it, and it works, man. And it makes me happy because it also stretches my mind, you know, and all that stuff. So I definitely did what I wanted to do on this album, you know, and then recording it in AZ was, uh, was cool. That did my best over there. And, uh, as far as the, the name of the album, you know, the pain, dude, Mr. Pain is like the, the core of like why I left of my cement, you know, after the back injury, it was just game over for me for so long. And even now to this day, I mean, at that point while recording Mr. Pain, it was starting to get to its all time high to the point when I left that studio that year, but aside from a few months ago, I was at the point where I couldn't even walk for more than 15 minutes without feeling like I had shin splints all over because my back was so messed up it was shifting all my legs and and joints and all down there so it was just like crazy agony so mr Payne is just yeah like you know the the album is to the eyes of mr Payne is like i mean obviously i wish i could add more to the title but mr Payne sums it up for me but it's like yeah i'm the guy that's in pain and this album is my life this album is the definition of trying to survive you know like scared in having you know all that angst and emotions and just doing your best because this is your last shot and as far as the response has gone it has been the best i've ever seen in day show and i think and that's solely because you know i think all the fans feel very uh connected to it and a part of it you know they built the album i, that does make I was sense, just got, yeah. i was just selling the shit you know what i mean so i couldn't have done it without them and they feel like a really really sense of connection and i think this album in general has built a core fan base even stronger than it ever was because, you know, I got down on a personal level with everybody. There's no more ego. There's no more nothing, dude. Like, this is me all by myself. I'm going to do it all by myself. Do you guys believe in me? Yes, we're doing it, you know? That's awesome. And uh, the response is awesome. I couldn't, I couldn't ask for anything more. You know, I'm just so thankful and grateful for, for all, of, all of that. And, and, and here I am. Um, now getting the proper back treatment, now feeling 50% better, and it looks like I'm only going upwards. I'm not sure how far I'm going to get with my health, but to alleviate the pain in any way is like all I can ask at this point, and I'm getting that. So <clears throat> more albums in the future, baby. Hell yeah, man. I mean, I'm glad to hear it because I was wondering about this back injury. I was like, man, he's still probably going through shit, but I'm glad to hear it's getting at least better now, and it can only hopefully get better from here. Um, you, you still have been playing shows under Day Shell. Uh, how does it feel performing these Day Shell songs live? Oh, uh, I haven't toured in like since last year. I think it was like mid last year or late last year. Mm. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's cool. Like, uh, you know, I have to hire on musicians, but I do have some cool people that I love that if I go out again, I'm definitely taking because they're just so such hard, hard workers. They respect me. They respect my no alcohol rule. And, they just kill it. And it's good, you know? It feels good. It's just, uh, I feel like I never get to tour consistently enough to get, the, to, you know, to break in the shoes. You know what I mean? Makes sense. I gotcha. So, so I'm always just like, right when the tour ends, I'm finally getting to my prime and ready <laughs> to tour. Right. You know? <laughs> so that's the only drag. But nonetheless, you know, it feels great. And, you know, even my last tour, I looked at it and I told everybody, I was like, this may be my last tour ever. I don't know how long my, my health is going to do this and whatever. So let's play a co- at least a couple of the new songs. We played Pressure and uh, Spellbound, which I really wanted to play Spellbound to push us all. And I just wanted to hear that shit live. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> so that's what we did. And that felt really great because, you know, that's all I could ask. So if my, that was my last tour. It may not have been the best, but at least I played the songs I wanted. Yeah, and there's some footage out there somewhere that you can always watch back to. Uh, I know I, I, I YouTube search it once in a while because uh, I like it. Um, before we talked, before we started recording, um, you are telling me you were doing a little bit of stuff with Joey Sturgis. Um, you just put that album out, Mr. Payne. We're at the beginning of 2020. What's the plan for the rest of 2020? The plan for 2020 is um, there's a few things floating around uh, the one thing that's for sure is continue to focus on my health, uh, continue to write the next best thing ever. Like I, you know, I pride myself on hopefully one upping myself every time I do an album. Other, otherwise, 
why am I releasing it? So, but it is uh, subjective to the listener, you know. But I mean, at least for me, I want it to be better. So I'm just going to really dive in to, to figure out as an artist and a songwriter and a singer and everything in between, like, how do I create, I mean, Deshaun kind of has a signature sound for the most part, but how do I create a un- more unique, more original, uh, refreshing sound, but still keep some of the elements that I want? And, and I, I don't know, it's definitely like a science project that's going on in my head. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm, I'm picturing a uh, math equation right now as you're saying these yeah. things. Yeah. Dude, it, it's hard because it, it, it's all based off of feeling and you can't really mathematically uh, figure that equation out for each individual. So it's just a matter of, I think, just trial and error. And I just continue to write, continue to isolate myself, avoid the party scene and uh, write, you know, like, I, I don't know. I'm definitely excited to see what I'm going to come up with. I have a lot of material still. And I'm still writing. It's just like there's a few that every like it seems like every four songs I write, it's one that I think could possibly be a magical one for the album. And that's not to say the other three suck. It's just they're more so they're more so just another Day Shell song that's good rather than holy crap, you know, and I'm right. looking for the holy crap. That's what I want. <laughs> I want an album of holy crap. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. That's my album name. Holy crap. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now we know. Um any final words to fans, anyone that's stuck throughout the years with you, anyone that's just now discovering you, anything at all? Yeah, man. Um, if they do come across me at a show or online, just remember I'm a human and I deal with shit. And sometimes I have a bitch face on my face, but it's nothing personal. It's just, I got a lot <laughs> of going on in my mind, you know? No, but for real, like, I just want to put the message out of anybody, like, has any sort of passion dude and you're you're putting it off because of whatever stupid reason because if you really think about it dive in your head you make up all these excuses and you try to justify them and you lie to yourself and the people around you and people pat you on the back too and agree with you but dude if you want something you literally just go for it you dive in 1010 percent, and there's no excuse you wake up each day you you do it the only reason why I'm here talking to you on the phone is because I do it. You know what I mean? I, and I go through hell and back each day to get to the end. And waking up, I'm like, here we go again. Here we go again. Right. But you know what? The payoff is, for me, in a sense, I may not be living for myself, but I live for my fans because I want to be a good role model. Like, I want to, if they, if they look up to me, I, want, I don't want to show them that the weakness can consume me or the darkness, however you want to look at it, so... Not to get too often a spiel, but, you know, go for it, dude. Don't give up. <laughs> That's an awesome ending of words. Uh, Shaylee, thank you so much for uh, letting me interview you here today. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No problem. I'm going to be talking to you here in a second off air. That's Shaylee from the band Day Show. Now, I'm going to leave you guys with a quick story about meeting Shaylee and Austin from Mice and Men way back in the day at Warp Tour. So it was whenever... Uh, you would have backstage passes that you could buy, and I had one of those, and uh, it was probably like 25 minutes before they played, and uh, me and my buddy were talking to this dude uh, that was just backstage because my friend had a Tool shirt on, and this dude was like, yo, Tool sweet, and we were like, yeah, they are, and we were talking about Tool, and we were looking at this dude, and he was like, man, I have no idea who this guy is. He's a really cool dude, and I looked down at his name tag. It's Shaley from Of Mice and Men, who had his hair cut, who I could not recognize because I did not recognize him without his hair, and I was like, oh my God, I am so embarrassed. I was just talking to this dude, and I didn't even realize. Part two. So then um, Austin comes out of somewhere, and everyone's like floating over to him. All I wanted to do was just shake his hand, take a picture with him. That's all I wanted to do. And uh, I I waited for everyone in line, and then uh, I got to up to him, and I was like, hey, man, I just wanted to get my... Just want to introduce myself. He's like, hey, dude, uh, I'm sorry. I have to run. We have to get ready for the show, like, right this second. My manager's waving at me. But uh, stick around here afterwards, and I will come find you. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool. I didn't think he was going to do that. So we watched from the side stage, and they played a good set. And at the very last song, security rushed everyone from the side stage off of the stage to the back. So when the song ended, they could easily get off, and the next band could load on. So I'm standing there like an idiot, not sure what to do. Austin said, wait here. Should I wait here? He doesn't know who I am. So I start walking away, and then all of a sudden, I get this big, hot, sweaty, reminder, it's warped horse, so it's like 100,000 degrees outside. 
arm around my shoulder. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? So I turn and it is Austin Carlisle from Of Mice and Men. He's like, dude, I was looking all over for you. And I was like, no freaking way. And if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, I'll put the picture up that I got with him. Uh, it's really, it's really cute and it's really funny. But that's my funny story from Of Mice and Men and Shaylee from Warp Tour way back in the day. Uh, thank you guys for watching and listening this episode of the KP Podcast. Again, big shout out to Shaylee from Day Shell for being on this. I was so stoked to do this, and I am still stoked to put this out. So, uh, thank you guys for listening, and as always, we will see you guys next time. Thank you.